Hi everyone, Rich Savell here. Today we're going to be talking about hepatic encephalopathy, and we have a special guest. Hello, I'm Jody. I'm a medical student. So, Dr. Savell, why are we speaking about hepatic encephalopathy today? Hepatic encephalopathy is an important diagnosis where patients who have it can end up in the intensive care unit, and we wanted to spend a few minutes today to share with you a basic structured approach to why patients get it, which patients get it, how they present, what's some of the pathophysiology, and I think most importantly, what's a reasonable structured treatment approach to patients who have this disease. So let's, let's do it. Let's go. So as you can see here from our first slide, hepatic encephalopathy is considered to be a spectrum of neuropsychiatric abnormalities seen in patients with liver dysfunction and as it says here, and or portosystemic shunting. But you should think about it when you are helping to care for a patient in the emergency setting or on the floor who has known liver dysfunction and who may start to have altered mental status. It's very important in a patient like that that you focus in not only on the altered mental status, but focus in on why you believe this patient has had an acute change in mental status. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So again, our overall for this educational video will be in four major areas. The etiology and pathogenesis of hepatic encephalopathy. We're going to talk about some of the diagnostic criteria. We're going to spend some time focusing in on the precipitating events for patients who present to you with hepatic encephalopathy. And then the last part will be to help you think about patients and how to treat them when they present with hepatic encephalopathy. So we wanted to start out by sharing with you the structured grading system for patients with hepatic encephalopathy. And as you can see here from the slide, it goes grades one to four. Grade one with euphoria and depression, lethargy, stage two, all the way up to stage four coma. And those patients are the ones that I'm gonna be involved with because they'll be critically ill and they won't be able to protect their airway and they'll be in the intensive care unit. You can see some other information here about the presence or absence of asterixis and what might be seen on their electroencephalogram. Jody, we put this slide in because we thought it was a nice way to help summarize the uh, spectrum of patients who have hepatic encephalopathy. And as you can see here, looking at the state of consciousness over time, the decrease in intellectual function, some problems with personality and behavior, and neuromuscular abnormalities as well. And uh, we really liked that uh, change over time, that it isn't strictly one, two, three, and four. The second point, and I, I really want this to be one of the major take-home points for this talk, is to remember that if you're caring for a patient who has known liver dysfunction and they come in with altered mental status, there are uh, certain items that are listed here on the slide that can trigger hepatic encephalopathy, but it's equally important that you rule out other crucial treatable events in patients. So for example, from a neurological standpoint that you've ruled out uh, uh, meningitis, that you've made sure they aren't having a stroke, that they're not having a pulmonary embolism, that they're not having sepsis from another reason because patients don't have to have liver dysfunction and have delirium from sepsis that they're not having spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So it is absolutely crucial before you start saying, oh great, I watched Dr. Savell's educational video on hepatic encephalopathy, let's start giving these medicines, that you think through why this is happening. So again, taking a moment on this, again, gastrointestinal hemorrhage is important, and as you and I were discussing about previously, gastrointestinal hemorrhage in the patient with liver dysfunction is a whole other video. But in the setting of concerns about altered mental status, that patient may have had such bad problems with gastrointestinal hemorrhage that they needed to have a TIPS procedure performed, and that's led to worsening of their hepatic encephalopathy. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Again, infection is absolutely crucial to think about, and dehydration, diuretics, and uh, other issues here that where you can think about a patient with liver dysfunction who's utilizing either alcohol or other drugs that clearly could be uh, tipping their homeostatic uh, position towards hepatic encephalopathy. So one of the problems in patients who have hepatic encephalopathy is that 
when we're discussing the pathophysiology and the pathogenesis, it's quite complicated. As you and I learned when we were preparing for this video, there is a lot of theory, there is a lot of hypothesis, and yet all of our drugs are focused in on decreasing systemic ammonia. And then you might say to me, well then great, Dr. Savell, can't we just check an ammonia level? Does that help? And unfortunately, Jody, the answer is not as straightforward as you might imagine. So you don't get to leave medical school saying, I check ammonia levels. Okay. Here's the problem. Patients can have hepatic encephalopathy and not have an elevated ammonia level. And there are some patients that I've cared for, and it's known, who have elevated ammonia levels and don't have hepatic encephalopathy. Okay. So it's one of the many controversies that has to be handled. We wanted to take the bulk of this video and focus in on how to treat the patient who presents to you with altered mental status in the setting of liver dysfunction. And as I mentioned before, and I'm going to take a few moments to talk about it again now, is the patient with that constellation needs to be evaluated globally to make sure that we're not missing something that's treatable that may that regardless of how we also treat the hepatic encephalopathy, if we don't treat their underlying pneumonia, their underlying SBP, their underlying urinary infection, their NSTEMI, that patient won't get better. So that's crucial. The second thing uh, is to talk about the basic categories of therapies, and all of them have in common to decrease the global burden of ammonia in the patient. And we're going to talk about non-absorbed sugars, we're going to talk about non-absorbed antibiotics and other uh, therapeutic interventions that can enhance ammonia metabolism. Okay. So the first is non-absorbed sugars. In this country, it's lactulose, and we've got a very exciting picture here in the corner of the lactulose. And I thought we could talk for a few moments about the mechanism because it's used so commonly, it's easy to forget the mechanism. Right. So the mechanism of lactulose I find interesting. It's a sugar that we can't break down, but bacteria think it's super terrific. And the bacteria break it down, and they actually decrease the colonic pH. And that decreased colonic pH takes ammonia and turns it back into ammonium, NH4+. See, chemistry, yay. And that NH4 plus is trapped in the colon and is passed in the stool. So it's very important, it's very commonly used, it's been used for quite some time. The patient needs to have three to four bowel movements per day with it as a way of titrating it in, and that's one way of decreasing the ammonia burden in these patients. The second category is the concept of non-absorbed antibiotics. And the concept of this is not new. When I was a medical student, it was a lot of neomycin that was utilized. And the current recommended agent is rifaximin. Rifaximin is another non-absorbed oral antibiotic that has multiple other uses, but is recommended as an adjunct of therapy in patients with hepatic encephalopathy. It's recommended for acute management. It is recommended if the patient is failing lactulose. And in general, it's not that we replace the lactulose with rifaximin, but that we add it. It is somewhat more costly and it really depends on the, the environment that you're in and how readily you have access to rifaximin. The concept here, in terms of the mechanism of decreasing the ammonia load, is that it is decreasing the production of ammonia by the bacteria. The third category that's interesting are uh, giving, for example, LOLA, L-ornithine L-aspartate, and this enhances the metabolism of ammonia to glutamine and urea, and decreases the amount of systemic ammonia that's available to hurt your brain and that's key so again and i want to emphasize this as part of the video is that when one reads about hepatic encephalopathy and the numerous complex theories behind why patients with liver dysfunction when they have acute worsening of their liver dysfunction develop encephalopathy our focus here is that all of those boil down to this final common pathway of decreasing the systemic burden of ammonia okay. because it's felt to be the most effective at this point. So Jody, we did it. We made an instructional video on hepatic encephalopathy. Great. 
why don't we talk about some of the take-home points? Okay, great. So take-home point number one is when do we think about hepatic encephalopathy in a patient? Great take-home point. So take-home point number one, you're caring for a patient with known liver dysfunction. It may be unknown. If you see a patient with altered mental status, do your best to find out that if they have cirrhosis or not. And if that patient has cirrhosis or any kind of known liver dysfunction and they have altered mental status, you need to start thinking about hepatic encephalopathy. Great. And take home point number two is that we have to always remember to look for why this happened to the patient in the first place. You've been listening to me, Jody, <laughs> and I'm feeling good about that. The focus on a patient who has altered mental status with liver dysfunction is you get to call it hepatic encephalopathy if you've ruled everything else out. And I want to make it clear what I'm talking about. Number one is that you need to make sure that the altered mental status primarily isn't due to something else and that the patient doesn't have hepatic encephalopathy, as we talked about before. Primary neurological problems, sepsis from other etiologies. And then when you do diagnose the patient, if you're confident you're calling your supervising resident, you feel this patient has hepatic encephalopathy, they still almost always have a precipitating clinical event that needs to be treated. So I hope I'm making that clear. Okay, yeah. And take home point number three is how do we actually treat hepatic encephalopathy? Again, A plus to you. So the focus on treatment of hepatic encephalopathy now, in addition to treating the inciting events, is to decrease the global burden of ammonia that can get to the brain, and we do that in uh, 2016 in three major ways. One is by trapping the ammonia in the colon by utilizing non-absorbable disaccharides, mostly lactulose in the United States. Number two, we decrease the colonic burden of ammonia by giving oral antibiotics that are not absorbed. Rifaximin is a main choice these days. And number three, although not so much in the United States, we give agents that enhance the metabolism of ammonia so that there is less ammonia to get to the brain. Okay, and our last take home point is how do we treat patients chronically for hepatic encephalopathy? So this was a point that we didn't touch on too much, but the data is, and just for completeness sake, that many patients who present acutely with hepatic encephalopathy, if they end up having recurrent hepatic encephalopathy, if they keep getting readmitted with it, they will often end up on a combination of either lactulose or lactulose and rifaximin. And again, as you and I learned in preparing for this, there's recent important data published in the New England Journal of Medicine and others showing the benefit of giving chronic therapy to patients with hepatic encephalopathy in terms of decreasing the likelihood of them getting readmitted. I think one of the other important points that you've emphasized and that we learned about in preparation for this is that hepatic encephalopathy is not benign and that patients who have cirrhosis and hepatic encephalopathy are at much higher risk for mortality, obviously hospital admissions, and so it really does matter to try and find those patients to treat the encephalopathy and do what we can to prevent recurrent encephalopathy in these patients. Thanks, Jody, for being part of the video. Great. Thank you, Dr. Savell. Thanks again for listening.